afternoon, everyone. Welcome to episode six of GSO Ocean Classroom Live. Uh, we are streaming live to you today uh, via Facebook as well as YouTube. So hello to both of those audiences. We'd also like to thank uh, or give a, offer a sincere thanks to the Devereaux Ocean uh, Foundation for its generous support in funding today's episode. My name is Holly Morin, and I am a marine biologist and science communicator with the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. And as uh, in other episodes, I will again be your host today. Uh, like our other GSO Ocean Classroom episodes, we also want to keep this really conversational. So your input and questions are super important to the success of today's program. So please make sure, please remember to ask any of your questions at any time during this event. You can type them into the comment box, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that are right there under the video player in Facebook, uh, or you can also uh, enter your questions into the chat box that are going to be on YouTube, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions today as possible. We also want to encourage you to please follow along uh, with URI and GSO um, and the Inner Space Center on YouTube and Facebook so you can stay up to date on uh, events such as this um, and more. So when we receive a new or when we release a new GSO Ocean Classroom video, uh, for YouTube, you want to make sure you click this is subscribe button, which is uh, right below the video view the viewer. And if you click the little bell icon that's there, then you'll receive the necessary notifications and other updates. And then in the same for Facebook, you just want to make sure you're following your IGSO uh, so you can get those notifications as well. So last episode, uh, which was back in June, we were talking about really great invertebrates, the horseshoe crab. And hopefully you all remember to celebrate International Horseshoe Crab Day on June 20th while you were celebrating Father's Day, of course. Uh, but today we're gonna switch to much bigger animals. Um, these animals, they have backbones, so they are known as vertebrates. So we're gonna be talking about whales, also known as cetaceans. Um, we're gonna be focusing on those species that we find right here in our own backyard, like this humpback whale. Uh, animals that are whales that are found in the waters of New England. Um, we're also going to talk about the tools and techniques that are used to research cetaceans and why it's important to study them. And then we might dive into a little bit about food web uh, dynamics too. Uh, so whales, did you know that they're mammals just like you and I? They are, they're not fish. So sometimes people mix those up. They breathe air using lungs to so take a deep breath with me. <sighs> So whales do the same thing. They might do it a little differently, but they're using lungs. They're warm blooded, they nurse their young, and they even have hair. Most people don't think of whales and hair, but they do. Some species have peach fuzz when they're born, and then they might have stubble actually when they're a little bit older. There are two types of whales. That's how we, we group them into two different groups. So the first group of whales are called toothed whales, or if you want to use their scientific names, these are called odontocetes. Uh, when you think of a toothed whale, you might think of this river dolphin here, or killer whales, or other dolphins. Uh, they have teeth, usually conical-shaped teeth. Harbor porpoise actually have spade-shaped teeth, and they're going to chomp their food. They don't chew it. Uh, they take it in one big bite, uh, and then they swallow it whole. Then there are the other group of whales, the ones that we're going to really focus on today, the baleen whales. These are called mysticetes. That's their actual scientific name. Um, and these are the filter feeders. There might be different ways of filter feeding, but they use long plates of baleen, which are made out of the same materials as your hair and fingernails, basically. Uh, and they strain out food from the water column. So I'm sure lots of you have made spaghetti or your or macaroni and cheese. And just as you strain out those noodles, this humpback whale here, you can see the baleen hanging from the top of its mouth. They are going to filter out fish, krill, or small zooplankton out of the water uh, column. They also have two blowholes. Odontocetes or toothed whales only have one blowhole on top, but our baleen whales have two. Um, so can you guys think of some baleen whales? There's that blowhole there on a right whale, the characteristic V-shaped spout. But can you all type in, share some thoughts. What are some baleen whales that we have here in New England waters or that you've seen somewhere else? Type in those now and we can get some feedback on what baleen whale species are. While you guys are typing in those answers, some ideas of baleen whales, I'm going to quickly introduce who our content expert is today. So we have Chris Orfanides. He's a research zoologist with the Protected Species Branch at NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And he's been studying marine mammal as well as sea turtle and seabird habitat distribution patterns to inform fisheries management decisions for over 15 years. Uh, he actually just completed his PhD, uh, which was with URI uh, GSO. So congrats on that. We can now call him Dr. Orfanides. Um, and he had his PhD actually looked at um, marine mammal distribution patterns in relation to prey abundance, 
um, and looking at potential right whale prey sources in southern New England and some other species as well, including harbor porpoise. And this is what we're going to be talking about, those baleen whales today. So, Chris, why don't you say hello and tell our audience a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, so I'm um, Chris Orfanides. Like uh, Holly said, I've been working for NOAA for a number of years in the Protected Species Branch. Um, I like to do science that has that informs management. So uh, science has a has a purpose to help manage uh, protected species uh, better. Um, I spent a lot of time working with harbor porpoise uh, research, as Holly said. A lot of it was with uh, bycatch. So trying to figure out ways to reduce bycatch of harbor porpoise and and bycatch is uh, when fishermen accidentally uh, catch an animal they don't they don't mean to. So they're not intending to catch harbor porpoise, but once in a while they do. Um, so I did that for a while, went back to school at URI and spent some time on URI ship the Endeavor and with Holly. That's where, uh, where we, we spent some time together on some really interesting research cruises. And the last few years I've been getting into a little bit more with uh, right whale research, uh, spe specifically uh, foraging ecology. So what whales eat um, and how their food is aggregated, how that interacts with uh, uh, the uh, ecology and uh, physical oceanography as well. And um, most recently, I started to do some work with uh, offshore wind development, basically trying to um, ensure that offshore wind is, is developed in a responsible manner that's, that's uh, and make sure we're doing okay as far as protected species are concerned, as the, the impacts are not too, too severe. So I think that's, that's what I have for now. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Chris. A reminder to everybody, in addition to uh, typing in your baiting whale suggestions, I know some folks said humpback whales, North Atlantic right whales, minke whales, you guys were all correct. Those are whale species, baleen whales that we have here in New England waters. I remind you all to please uh, type in your questions anytime uh, during today's program, and that could be about whales, it could be about Chris's background experience, um, it could be about research in general on a ship, um, how Chris or actually myself uh, got our start in this field. That's actually the, the fun thing about today is not only am I the host of the program, is but I also get to be a content expert, which is great and fun for me. Um, my background is also in marine mammal science. Uh, I conducted research on another type of marine mammal species. So I was looking at sea lions for my master's degree. Here I am uh, with a stellar sea lion on deck and we put satellite tags. That's what that blue neoprene pancake thing looks like on its back and it's a nice little hat there. And this allowed these animals to travel um, and basically email me uh, their data. I was in Alaska in the winter and I went to school in Texas. So it was much nicer in Texas during the winter than in Alaska. Uh, and they would remotely communicate where they were diving and where they were going, which uh, similar to right whales and what Chris was looking at, stellar sea lions are actually another endangered species up in Alaska that we're trying to figure out uh, what was happening with them uh, and potential management issues. And then I also actually worked at NOAA Fisheries uh, on some of the right whale management uh, issues that Chris's research actually helps to inform. So it becomes a small Rhode Island marine mammal world that Chris and I get to share with you uh, today. So hopefully you all remember questions at any time. Chris and I are super excited uh, to be participating in this and sharing our knowledge with you all today. Um, and I'm going to round things off, Chris, actually. Let's start this up with whales. We, has, we heard a lot of different baleen whale species, folks who are really sharp and listed a different a bunch of minke whales, right whales, humpback whales. Are these the whales that are common to the waters of southeastern New England? Are there other species? Um, right whales, fin whales, say whales, minkies, um, what else? Humpbacks. Those are, those are probably the primary species that we have in our waters. And they, they're a lot of them are here for a good portion of the year, but it is, they do move seasonally and um, are, might be here in larger numbers in certain seasons than others. That was one of my questions was that if there are these whales year round residents or um, if they're migrating, where are they migrating to and from? Yeah, they generally migrate. Um, they'll spend the summers or the warmer weather uh, up north feeding and then many of them will go south to calve. Uh, for It depends on the species. A lot of species, we don't know exactly where they go. And a lot of them are very wide ranging, perhaps across, you know, much of the Atlantic. So <clears throat> they do spend, there are some that spend a fair amount of time in, in our area. And uh, we've had, you know, aerial survey studies where they, and where they fly airplane over the region to try to figure out where, where whales are and when they're there. 
Um, and then we also have passive acoustic studies where we listen for whales underwater. And uh, with the passive acoustics, they've detected a number of whale species nearly all year round, where previously we thought they were only here more seasonally. So um, something like right whales are in, actually in our waters almost just about every month of the year. Um, it's concentrated from January, say from January to April, for, or at least from winter into, uh, into the spring, um, with fewer in the summertime, but, but they can be around that time as well. So actually the video that's being shown here is a, a right whale mom, a female right whale with her calf. Um, so if we're talking about right whales, they're up here to feed and then they migrate down to Georgia, the coastal waters of Georgia and Florida. But um, some of them do. But then if I understand correctly, Chris, what you're saying, the other ones, we don't necessarily know where they might be going, but they might be staying around in these waters year round. Yeah, some whales like fin whales have been uh, detected acoustically um, south of south of Rhode Island for pretty much the whole year. There might be a little gap there in the summertime. And other whales like say whales will come in. They're more, uh, <clears throat> they don't spend a lot of time here, but they come in and feed on the same sort of whales, uh, same sort of prey that right whales feed on uh, in the springtime and, and maybe late winter. And then they might head out to other regions for the rest of the year. So you just mentioned that fin whales and right whales are feeding on similar things. What, what are they feeding on? Uh, a, a lot of whales feed on various types of plankton. Um, in, a, in our area is, is something uh, called a copepod. Mm -hmm. It looks like a, a little bug you find in the water. They're about the size of a, a grain of rice. Um, and so for right whale eating these copepods, uh, when you compare the size of the copepod to the right whale, for, for us, that would be equivalent to, I think it was uh, us eating some, some bacteria, I heard someone say, but quite small uh, relative animal size so they need a lot of them and high concentrations in, in one place and that's an image of the uh, calanus from March gets the the primary prey for right whales although they do eat some other copepods as well yeah to give folks a, a size of scale so a right whale can actually reach up to about mm, 52 feet in length and it can weigh up to 140,000 pounds. So if you're talking about a whale of that size eating something the size of a grain of rice, they are estimated to eat more than 2,000 pounds of copepods every day. So here's a nice uh, image showing you actually the different sizes of whales, the baleen whales specifically. So the right whale is that purple one right in the middle that has that highly arched claw. Right whales have very long baleen, so those plates that are hanging down or those fibers from the inside of their mouths that act as a strainer. They can be up to eight feet in length. So I always like to give my kids, I usually use my husband for scale. So he's almost six feet. So it's longer than daddy. Um, but other species have shorter or more um, dense uh, uh, baleen, uh, depending on what they're feeding on. Because other whales will feed on fish, correct? Like this, that humpback whale that was just shown, those are actually going after and gulping up big schools of fish. Yeah, some some uh, whales like humpback whales, minke, and and sometimes prey, uh, say whales can can switch the prey that they uh, they feed on, and so some they can often eat fish, like schooling small schools of fish, um, like herring and things, uh, and otherwise. But but and sometimes they can feed on plankton as well. Yeah, awesome. So a reminder to everybody, if you have questions, definitely type those in so we can answer them throughout today's program. Um, we definitely want to make sure, you guys, uh, that we engage you all and take as many of those questions as possible. Um, so let's see. What do you guys think? I'm going to throw a question out to all of you in Facebook and YouTube world. Um, do you think that these whales, that they all feed in the same way? Think about it. They feed in the same way. They're baleen whales, they're filter feeders. Do you think that there's different ways you can filter out food out of the water? What do you all think? I know Chris, you and I know the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> we already talked about one that we can talk about that there are the right whales and they're what we consider ram feeders, right? And so that they're just kind of chugging along skin feeding through the water surface. Um, their vertebrae are actually fused. Their head is one third of their body length. It's this huge, giant stream. Uh, but other ways, Chris, what are the other ways that baleen whales are going to, the other methods they use to actually um, filter or feed on animals or critters or prey in the water column? 
Um, another way is is they can gulp, basically gulp a, a school of fish, for example. Humpbacks would often do that, um, and then right whales often just skim the surface. Um, so there's a few different different types. You can right whales swim slowly and and filter feed nearly continuously, and other whales uh, kind of school. Uh, bring a group of fish together, and then we'll just try to gulp the whole thing. Yeah, and then you have the great thing about humpback whales, when you think about it, or blue whales, those rorquals, they have throat pleats on them that will distend or open up when they take open, they take in a big mouthful of water. Um, I always find it interesting to mention, even though they're not found in our waters, gray whales, um, they're a little different. They're suction feeders that go along the bottom there and that they, um, they actually suck up mud and take in mouthfuls of mud and then go up to the surface to use the water and gravity basically to drain all the mud out of all the critters that were in the mud inside. Uh, well done, Rosemary Connolly. She actually mentioned that humpback whales use bubble neck feeding, Chris. Um, so is that something that we usually see up here in New England, are whales using uh, bubble net feeding? You can see that, yeah, on, on Stellwagen Bank, which is um, just off of Boston, kind of between Boston and Cape Cod, you can go out on a whale watching boats in, in, during the summertime. And some of those whales do use bubble feeding occasionally. So the humpbacks in particular are pretty creative and come up with some, uh, some interesting ways to, to feed. Yeah, and that sometimes can even be coordinated where you have multiple whales working together where one is kind of spiraling up and blowing bubbles that get bigger as they rise to the surface, which makes mm -hmm. your wall get denser. And then if I remember correctly, somebody or a whale makes a trumpeting sound or some type of sound, and then that coordinates the behavior so they can all come up to the surface together. Um, so I think it's, I've seen that a couple of times on whale watches where you have multiple whales feeding, and it really is quite a fantastic thing to see. Um, so they said, so let's see, we have a question or a comment from Adrienne Carr, and she was saying that when she's been on a whale watches, she primarily sees humpback whales. Um, and she wanted to know if whale watching ships disturb the whales feeding, uh, which I think is a great question uh, to talk about potential disturbance from any type of human activity, Chris. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a concern, but I think the, the folks running the right uh, the uh, whale watching cruises are, are pretty careful. and. And by law, you have to keep a certain distance, um, so they make sure not to not to get in the way. Um, so I think any whale watching trips that I've, I've seen have, have been pretty cautious about that. I mean, there's there's plenty of other human disturbances um, from, uh, like I said, with bycatch accidentally getting caught in fishing gear um, to uh, ship strikes. So for right whales, uh, the ship strikes and entanglement in in Lines from pot gear, often uh, uh, lobster lobster gear, are a couple primary concerns as far as their conservation goes. So there's a lot, a real lot of effort to try to uh, improve, um, limit the number that are injured in the, in those ways. So for right whales, they've they've changed the shipping lanes a number of years ago into the Boston because um, the right whales like to hang out in particular areas where the, the ships also were, and they don't they don't tend to move out of the way for whatever reason. They just I don't know if they don't notice or they don't care, but they tend to get run over. <laughs> and then uh, as far as entanglements in, in fishing gear, there's a lot of research recently into uh, ropeless fishing gear. So basically what that is, is uh, let's say you have a lobster trap and you put it on the bottom and there's a mechanism on the bottom where um, when the fisherman comes back, they send a signal to it. It sends a buoy up with a line and they haul that back that way. Because a lot of times, the whales will swim into those uh, the the fishing line for, that's connected from the uh, surface to the to the top, the trap on the on the ocean floor. So so that's a primary concern. And and there's also um, there's a number of, of management uh, things that are that are in the works as far as limiting the amount of fishing gear in the waters relative to right whales. Yeah, um, and that's a great point is that so two things when uh, commercial ships, they actually have a, a an app or a notification system that a lot of these commercial vessels are tagged into um, that when a white whale is detected, it's actually using passive acoustics, uh, mainly similar to what Chris was mentioning, where they're listening for whales, especially bright whales underwater, that these ships have to slow down to 10 knots. Uh, I believe they have to be 10 knots in the shipping lanes, Chris, right. if I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah, ten knots. If you're if the vessel is sixty five feet or over, I believe, and yeah, especially heading into Boston, there's a series of um, passive acoustic uh, recorders that are 
<clears throat> that are deployed there and they uh, yeah broadcast back in real time so they'll let the ships know if um, whales are in the area. Right, and then um, the other thing, yep, there's the whale alert app, perfect. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that it's not so much these bigger vessels or the, the whale watching vessels, which do actually have to go through a rigorous training now. Um, they can be certified, uh, certified whale friendly, for lack of a better word, whale watching boat, but recreational boaters. Um, there are guidelines, but no specific laws. Um, so one thing, if you're out in the water, um, see a spout, watch out is actually a, a great resource to look to. Um, for guidelines for safe uh, viewing when you're out on the water. Um, and there's a lot of different tips there as to what you can do. Um, basically, you're, you're slowing down, you're giving space. Um, you don't want to go head on or chase a marine mammal or chase a whale. If you see bubbles, um, you know, you want to stay clear. I know people get really excited about wanting to see the whales and get as close as possible. Uh, but actually, during whale watching trips, I've seen, I've seen a lot of recreational vessels just kind of fly on through an area when you really should be giving animals space. So something to keep um, keep mindful of um, for recreational boating. Um, and then um, for uh, the fishing gear, there's actually seasonal area management um, that's set up where there are certain times of the year that fishing gear uh, can be set in a certain water. And this, in certain waters, this includes Cape Cod Bay um, as well as George's Bank. And then there's another one that's not shown on this map here, actually for Southeastern Nantucket Shoals, they just instituted. Um, and so what you have to have here is specialized gear um, that whales can break free from if they get entangled. Um, and it's during set times that were determined when these whales have been known to be in these waters. Um, and again, Chris's research that he's been conducting is helping to inform some of these management decisions um, and, and how to best protect whales in this species, uh, in these areas, excuse me. So um, a question came in from Facebook. Uh, so uh, Marcy Cole Eckberg would like to know, how is climate change affecting right whale populations or any other baleen whales? I think this is a fantastic question. It gets back to the food web dynamics um, that we mentioned earlier, or the copepods we were talking about that they feed on, those little grains of white rice that are full of oil. That's what they like them to be, fatty, uh, fatty little fatty resources for them. But how is climate change impacting copepod distributions, or is it changing them, Chris? Uh, yes, I think it's had a big impact. So around 2010, so NOAA does a lot of aerial surveys looking for right whales um, for a lot of uh, identification. There's only about 400 of them left in the North Atlantic right whales anyway, in the, um, in the, wor in the world. And so there's a lot of aerial surveys and, there's, and they know they can identify right whales, uh, each individual. So they do surveys consistently. And in 2010, uh, there seemed to be a switch. We, Noah couldn't find a lot of whales for, for much of the year. Um, and then after that, they found them in, in different places. So a couple of the places where they typically feed, or where they used to traditionally feed pretty consistently, they go from one place to, to another in different seasons. Um, a lot of that switched. So <clears throat> a number of right whales have migrated up in the summertime up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, the last few years, early, possibly before that, but last few years is when we have it documented. So um, in that time period, they, which they ran into a bunch of trouble up there. They've, uh, with uh, crab pots and also some, um, some, some vessel collisions. So they certainly have moved in it. Uh, so, cause their food, the thought is we'll go, still go to their traditional feeding locations, but if there's not a good food source there, if it's not there in the right densities, then they'll move on. So it seemed like their primary prey, the Calanus finmarchicus, the copepod, um, their distribution is is re being reduced in some areas, some areas it's still holding on. There's still a lot in seasonally in Cape Cod Bay, um, but other areas like the Bay of Fundy, there's not nearly, doesn't seem to be nearly as much or at least as consistent. So the right whales will show up there where they used to feed a lot um, for much of the summer. Um, and then if they're not, if there's not enough food there, they'll just move on from somewhere, somewhere out. So it's it's a challenge for management too when you don't know where the whales are going to be when previously they were in. You knew where they were going to be at certain times of the year. So yeah, now they're also showing up off uh, off of New York Harbor. Um, a lot of whale species are, and I remember we had humpback whales actually off of Narragansett Beach uh, a couple of summer ago that you could actually see from the seawall here in Rhode Island. And I know that you know you, you know that they're there, but you just don't see them. Um, and I know off of New York now, they have some of those passive acoustic listening devices, similar to what's in Massachusetts Bay. They have those there as well um, to, to try to get a better idea for when the animals are in there in the water. Right. And in the last several years, uh, southern New England, south of um, Nantucket, near Nantucket Shoals, has 
been a region that we didn't think previously right whales spent much time in, but in the last several years, we've figured out that they're they're often there from uh, say December through or January through April, and then sometime the rest of the year as well. But concentrated in those regions, and we really didn't know that until until I think it was 2010 when they couldn't find them elsewhere. So let's let's take a look in southern New England. Someone may have called in or a site and. I think they found about 100 that year in April south of, south of Rhode Island. So, Yeah, that's actually something um, that you all can look to if you're interested. There's actually an interactive um, tracking map that NOAA puts out. Um, and I believe that the link will be shared on Facebook or YouTube and, and both of the, the comment or chat boxes there um, that you can go look to to see. And you can sort by year, you can sort by month to see where right whales have been sighted, whether it's from the aerial survey or ship-based survey or another source. Um, it's just a really great tool um, to see where the animals may be shifting their patterns. It's something that's really nice. It's public facing. Uh, really quick, Chris, uh, with the aerial surveys and, and COVID, did that get impacted at all? Do you know um, the surveys for right whales and were actually any whale species, those aerial surveys happen on a pretty regular basis, um, mm -hmm. but did the current COVID situation impact that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm not sure if they're back flying yet, um, but they were at least down for, for a number of months where you know, you're, it's a few people, or I'm not sure quite how many is often in a plane, but <clears throat> a few to several people in a small area, a plane for several hours, it's, you know, the, not, not probably the safest place to be in this sort of situation. So yeah, those flights have been grounded um, for quite a while. And, uh, and all, <clears throat> just about all of NOAA's uh, ship activity, at least in our region, has been um, delayed or grounded as well. So no one's been out on any, on any of our ships and last few months. Right. All righty. So when we're talking about ships, by the way, folks, great questions. Keep them coming. Um, but I wanted to share with you all, we're talking about ships and aerial surveys. Those are one of the ways uh, that um, researchers or managers can actually study um, uh, baleen whales uh, in our waters. And so what I want to do is share actually a quick video with all of you um, that was made by uh, a few of the URI students that are in the honors program um, that were out on the cruise, uh, one of the cruises that Chris and I sailed on um, and were supporting his PhD research. Um, and it's a really nifty video. They did a really fantastic job, but it kind of summarizes all the other tools that can be used to study uh, baleen whales, right whales, etc. cetera. So uh, I'm going to share that with you all now so you can kind of get a feel for that. And Chris, we can actually, there's no, there's, there's some really nice music that plays with this, but we can actually talk over it. So these are the different tools that were deployed and used uh, during the cruise. Um, so they're gonna get listed out here. These kids were actually, the students were tasked with making stop motion videos. Um, so it's really fascinating that this was Joe who actually drew all of these things, Joe Stratton, that he could actually do it on a, on a whiteboard. So one of the first tools are big eye binoculars, Chris. These are a pretty uh, important tool on a ship-based survey, correct? Yeah, so those are used basically to find animals and they're, you can see they're quite big and so they have to be mounted on a stand there because you couldn't hold them up and you just swivel them back and forth and uh, <clears throat> record what, what whales you see. As, yeah, as, and it's, they can, how far out can those binoculars see? Uh, Do you remember? Uh, I don't remember. It's yeah, pretty far it's, out. It's <laughs> several miles at least. I can't remember the exact number. I want to say 10,000 meters maybe. Yeah. And then an echo sounder allows you to see underwater. It's using underwater sound to kind of visualize what might be in the water column. Um, and that was to find out where maybe pockets of prey, dense patches were in the water. And then the video plankton recorder is what was deployed to go ahead and actually look at uh, plankton in the water correctly. It was finding different species of, of plankton or other animals that are in the water column uh, that the whales might be eating. Right. And yeah. We combine a few things. We have we use nets as as shown here, the video plankton recorder, which take, takes pictures and you can tow it up and down in the water to get a sense of what's going on in the whole area. And then and the echo sounders, which is like basically a glorified fish finder, like you might have on your own boat. Yeah, so those are nice to have the three different tools and then you're able to kind of uh, combine them to get an idea of what the prey field might be. And then this is one of those devices that Chris and I have mentioned, it's called a hydrophone, basically an underwater microphone um, that will pick up different sounds, uh, different whale calls potentially. There it is, there's Chris actually working to deploy it over the side and allows you to listen for whales in case you can't see them, which sometimes, I think during our last Endeavor cruise, Chris, we had some interesting weather um, where, you know, 
it was either super foggy and you couldn't see anything or it would clear out and be really high waves in surf, which made it very difficult to deploy gear or to keep people from getting seasick um, with the footage we have here. Uh, but um, your your research, um, what, what are some of the key highlights that you found out from your research and going out on these different cruises? <laughs> Find out, find out. It's pretty difficult to find to find right whales. Often, there's only about 400 of them left. So, uh, and and not all of them are in the same region at once. So, it's it can be pretty challenging. So, working at sea was tricky, um, and especially we're often out there in March and April. And the weather, as you know, is often pretty windy, stormy. So that the weather was quite a challenge. So, uh, like you said, I think next time we will um, look at. Uh, include some pass more passive acoustics rather than relying on visual sightings. But um, the, as far as what the right whales are eating in that area, it's still, it's still up in the air a little bit. There's, there's some of their traditional food, especially um, later in the season and uh, more inshore, but off, uh, for a little further offshore, it's, it's not really sure. We're not really sure what they're eating because their, their traditional food isn't, doesn't appear to be there in, in larger um, quantities. So we're still, we're still looking into that. Great. And then we have one last question from Facebook. So Priscilla wants to know, I don't know if you know this, Chris, is how much of an impact has plastic pollution or plastic in the waters had on these whales? Um, I haven't I haven't seen too much actually about plastic with, with the whales. I mean, I'm sure they must in, ingest some being filter feeders. Mm -hmm. I can't think of studies off the top of my head that have kind of quanti quantified that. No, the only thing I can think of was actually the story that ran in the news that was a sperm whale that had stranded and washed up on a beach and how much plastic it had had in its uh, gastrointestinal system. But I don't know anything, I'm the same, of any published literature looking at that. Um, but I agree that it's, it's probably a concern, just not quantified at this time. Yeah, and sperm whales eat primarily squid. And so I could see them eating bigger pieces of plastic, which they might confuse for, <clears throat> for a squid, whereas the baleen whales are filtering smaller prey. So you'd have to get the microplastic that's kind of broken down into small beads or something like that. Right, right, exactly. All right, well, it is 4.30, a little after 4.30, so I'm gonna thank everybody for joining us today, and hopefully you've learned something new about whales, especially those that are here in New England waters. Uh, the influences that the food web can have on the distribution patterns of these whales, and then how important it is to do research like that, that Dr. Orphanides has been conducting over the last several years. Um, we always like to round out our events with uh, some homework. Um, I know it's a summertime, but this is a classroom event, so it's always, we want to give you guys a little bit of homework. So I mentioned earlier that one important thing um, is responsible marine mammal viewing, uh, especially with the current COVID situation. I know a lot of people are getting outside, which is fantastic. It's great. But you want to make sure you're, if you come across a marine animal, um, you want to respect that wildlife. Um, so if you find a seal on the beach, I know in Massachusetts or um, New, in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, all of these uh, coastal states right now in New England, if you find a seal, it's actually supposed to be there. It's normal for them to be on the beach. Uh, they haul out on land to rest. So you want to make sure you actually give them distance. Don't stress them out more while they're resting. Um, definitely keep your dog on check as well. Um, and don't feed marine wildlife. You don't need to feed them. Uh, and again, don't chase or try to touch them. I know they're cute. We don't need to necessarily hug them though. Um, and then when it comes to whales, you want to keep about 100 yards or about the length of a football field if you're out in the water between you and that whale. Uh, but for right whales, it's 500 yards. Um, and then again, if you see a spout, watch out. There's that great resource to check it out. And it gives you a, a list of best practices for viewing veil, uh, whales when you're out on the water. Um, if you come across a marine mammal or a turtle, not seabirds, um, that you do believe is in trouble, your best action is to actually call the New England Mid-Atlantic Stranding Hotline. Um, and that number is going to be 866-755-6622. It's going to scroll right along the bottom of the screen here. Um, and that you can also radio the Coast Guard um, if you come across a whale that's out uh, in the water. Um, or you could actually find out where your closest stranding uh, group is. So for Rhode Island, I can know that that's actually the Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut. Um, but be aware that given the current COVID-19 situation, some of these stranding groups are actually not operating um, to their full capacity at this time. Do not try to uh, attempt to rescue a stranded animal on your own, um, as that's going to put you and the animal um, in a dangerous position, even though you mean very well. Um, Chris, anything else you can think of as a, as a call to action for these interested folks today? You did a great job, Holly. <laughs>
Perfect. So thank you again, Chris, for sharing your knowledge, your time, your expertise with us today. Thank you again to the Devereaux Ocean Foundation uh, for their support. Definitely check out the various websites that have been listed either in the chat box for YouTube or in the comment box for Facebook. Um, and that way you can look to those projects um, and other uh, groups for other information that was discussed today. Uh, make sure, again, you're following along with URI, GSO, and Interspace Center, as well as uh, NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center, their social media handles, um, so Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and stay tuned for more GSO Classroom Live events. If there are topics that you're super interested in, um, make sure you let us know. Uh, and actually, we're going to be talking about sharks on July 30th. So save your date, uh, save your date, save the date, and mark your calendar for what will be a, uh, a very exciting program then as we, again, take a bite out of the topic of sharks. Uh, until that time, though, thank you again, Chris. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Be well, stay safe, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bye -bye. Robert. Thanks for having me.